Hi everyone and welcome to another Luca lecture. The topic of today's lecture will be René Magritte, a surrealist artist from Belgium. Magritte's power comes in his selection of very, very simplistic objects that are very familiar to the viewer and putting them in a surrealistic combination uh, along with a title to create a very powerful piece of art. Magritte was born in 1898 and showed an early aptitude towards art. He began taking art lessons in 1910. Uh, but his early life was, was marked in some ways by tragedy. His mother had severe mental issues, and this culminated in her taking her own life uh, very early on in his life. Uh, later on, in 1916, he would study at the Royal Arts Academy uh, in, there in Brussels, and this is where we first see some of his work start to emerge. Much of his early paintings follow the trends of the time in terms of avant-garde work. Uh, here we have a landscape piece from 1920 that is very, very brightly colored, but very much has a cubist tendency to it in the way that he's breaking up the planes of the canvas. Uh, but then we transition or we switch into uh, a painting more like this one, uh, a portrait of Pierre Bourgeois, uh, where again we have this more kind of favistic, impressionistic style that he's working his way through. Again, very, very bright, bright colors, but very much in the sense of abstraction in comparison to what we would think of as his later work. And here we have even a third view or a third way of looking at uh, a canvas bathers from 1921, where again, we have this tendency of cubism, uh, but we also have this kind of overall sensation of surrealism that might be brought about by some of the surrealist artists that he was looking at at this time as well. Georgette at the Piano from 1923 is a cubist portrait of his future wife, Georgette Berger, uh, who will play a key role in many of the paintings that he does in the future. He, this woman will be his primary model in addition to his wife. Uh, from 1920 to 1921, Magritte served in the military, and in 1922, as I mentioned, uh, he marries Georgette Berger. From 1922 to 1926, he also embarks on a career uh, in commercial design. And many of these images that we have from his work as a commercial design kind of show this fusion uh, between the different elements that we saw previously between cubism and kind of favism and surrealism. We also start to see a return uh, to realism, as we see in the, in the image there on the right. Uh, this will have an important role, I feel, in his future work, but we still kind of have this cubist feeling to a lot of the work that he did during the 1920s, and if we think about the popularity of Juan Gris uh, and people like Picasso, it makes wonderful sense that an artist would emulate these styles. Uh, what's kind of a separation that we have between what he's doing and what a lot of the other cubists were trying to do uh, is he's not really exploring the planes of what he's looking at in quite the same way that the cubist were. He's more using it as kind of a decorative element uh, rather than actually investigating things in a purely cubist sense. Here we have a self-portrait from this time period and you can kind of see what I mean there by looking at his face and you'll notice that he's not really exploring the planes of the face as much as he's just using different sections uh, and illuminating them. We see the same type of cubist treatment uh, in the painting Youth from 1924, where he's more using it as this decorative element, and again, even kind of creeping towards surrealism, uh, even in this early work. With all of these different elements in this painting, it, 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 it kind of becomes a topsy-turvy event uh, in terms of what's in the foreground and what's in the background, and the way the different aspects actually fuse together. We begin to see a radical change in his work around 1925, as witnessed in this painting, The Bathers, where you'll notice the amazing amount of simplicity of uh, the image in comparison, especially to the image we just looked at. Uh, again, I think that his role in, as an advertiser helped him understand what he wanted to put in terms of his canvas, and as we move forward into 1925-26, he creates his first surrealist work with The Lost Jockey.
Several things that we'll notice, uh, the trees have been replaced by banisters or pillars that have been made out of musical sheets. You'll notice this kind of chaotic drawing of geometry on the ground. In the very middle we have uh, what is the lost jockey riding through the scene. And I say scene because if you look closely, you'll notice that these curtains have been painted in uh, as if it has been pulled open and we're looking into almost a stage-like setting. Uh, this use of a curtain will continue in a few of his early works. We see it again in the painting Nocturne, uh, where we have it over on the right side kind of parted away, matching the red bird that's flying again towards this banister uh, pillar slash figurative element that again has an allusion to music. In this, it's very close to the other painting where we have that geometry on the ground and the figure is looking at a painting, uh, in this case within a surrealistic landscape. We see that illusion of the curtain one more time uh, in the painting The Window, where if you look off in the distance we have the pyramid structure and then in the foreground we have the geometric form. Uh, but again, kind of this curtain being pulled back, dividing what we would think of as actual reality uh, from a subconscious or surrealistic reality that he's created. Uh, moving forward, we can see that banister that I was talking about earlier, uh, banister chess piece really becoming figurative in the most literal of senses within this painting. Uh, and again, when we look at this, we again have that curtain parting, and there in the background we have a, a small town. The thing that you'll notice in comparison to his later works is there isn't quite the, the simplicity that we'll find uh, in a lot of his paintings. When we look at the images like this one, uh, you'll notice that there's different elements within it, but uh, it's as almost as if we've wandered into a surrealistic play uh, rather than looking at a, a, a definitive piece of art. Uh, in Untitled 1926, again this allusion back to music, uh, we start to see this simplicity of form that we know so well from his later paintings. We begin to see the narrowing down of the complexity of these early works into a really, really uh, a clear idea of what he wants to present in paintings like Popular Panorama, where in this we have three different landscapes and he's kind of just layered them on top of each other with almost a puzzle-like cutout leading between uh, the different layers. And again, uh, in the, the Catapult of the Desert, uh, almost a, a early Dolly painting with this one, uh, the removal of a lot of the just extra things that we saw uh, in the early works leading into these paintings. Another interesting aspect I find in his early surrealistic work in comparison to his later paintings is in these he's really trying to create uh, a dreamlike space uh, as much as a state. And again, I think of, of a lot of Salvador Dali paintings in connection to this where uh, it's literally like we're in a different environment uh, and that's where these surrealistic activities are occurring. Uh, I make note of this because in his later works we don't really have that same kind of surrealistic space uh, as much as we just have this kind of tendency of surrealistic things within what we would think of as normal reality. And we start to even see this kind of playing out uh, in images like this one where uh, again, uh, far away looks from 1927, it's really just a person's face that's been doubled up and we don't have that same kind of environmental space uh, that was created in even the previous work that we just looked at. Uh, leading into 1927, uh, he has an art show that actually does not do uh, very well at all. Uh, and despite his, uh, his not uh, success, we'll say, rather than failure, he decides to move to Paris in 1927 and he becomes friends with many of the Surrealists, including André Breton. We see a distinctive change in Magritte's work once he is in Paris and is working with other artists, including uh, Breton, where 
we start to see an inclusion of other aspects of uh, things that make him famous, things like language, uh, and also in particular his way of kind of making these categories of things, uh, as we will see in One Night Museum from 1927, where he's taking just simplified objects and putting them in a space, but by doing so, really elevating them to this level of thought. You'll notice that one of the cupboards is kind of covered over with a little hand-cut piece that you can make little faces out of as well. Uh, here's the inclusion of language in addition to those objects that we looked at uh, just previously with One Night at the Museum. This is the beginning of his very famous uh, incorporation of just simplistic language within directly within the painting. Uh, and what makes this very, very interesting is he's one of the first artists to kind of do this. Uh, and, and again, when we look at this, we see very, very simple ideas, but things like the bird uh, is made out of a knife rather than actually being a bird and table, focusing again to the leaf where uh, we don't have quite a direct association, rather an indirect one. We also start to see the inclusion of this character that is, is somewhat autobiographical, the man in uh, the famous bowler hat that we can first see within this work. Uh, this will become a, a, a regular character within Magritte's paintings uh, and almost becomes his calling card, if you will, uh, later on. Uh, the pipe from 1927 is probably his most famous early version of the, the painting that will be, uh, this is not a pipe, that will be his most famous painting. Uh, we have this early version uh, uh, all the way uh, as early uh, as 1927. We also see this incorporation of larger paintings too. Uh, he hasn't completely abandoned this uh, as well within his, his total sphere, but you will also see that he's really starting to narrow down uh, what specifically he wants to incorporate within a painting. When we see his work in and around 1928, we really see the perfection of, of what he will be uh, doing with his canvases, and this is usually uh, one element within a space and then uh, a very interesting title. The painting we're looking at here, The Perfume of the Abyss, is a, is a wonderful example. We have these towers kind of hanging over a cliffside, and that's one component, but then we actually read uh, the title, which is The Perfume of the Abyss, and that adds the second layer to the work uh, and really transforms it into uh, a surrealistic piece of art. We see the same treatment when we look at the painting Secret Life Number no. 4 from 1928, where we just have this object. Uh, it could be a piece of fruit. It's this round sphere, and it's within this space. And again, we kind of question what the title has uh, direct connection to uh, the object in the space that it's in. Uh, here's another wonderful example with The Delights of Landscape from 1928, uh, where we have a picture frame that's titled, and then over on the right, uh, we have what would be perceived as a hunting rifle. And uh, again, it's almost as if the title carries as much weight as the painting itself. Here is one of his more famous images from this time, The False Mirror. Uh, again, a wonderful title that, that makes you kind of contemplate the piece of art in a different way, but here we simply have a human eye uh, with a sky put over the top of it, uh, again, re a reflection, but again, moving back to that concept of the false mirror. In The Invention of Life from 1928, we again see his wife, Georgette, within the painting, but we also have a secondary figure that's completely shrouded. Uh, whether or not this is the second figure of Georgette or a self-portrait of the artist remains a mystery. Uh, and we see this kind of thematic play out occasionally in his work going forward. Uh, we again see it in The Lovers from 1928 where their faces are completely covered uh, in this wrapping. Uh, and actually it reminds me a lot of Christo's work. Uh, if you're familiar with his work, he does a similar thing uh, with objects. Another important aspect of his work that we haven't 
addressed very much is the inclusion of aspects of music or musical instruments. Uh, we see it here with these giant orbs that are hovering above a landscape. Uh, this could easily be a painting for UFOs, but what these are, in, in fact, are, are grolos, uh, more commonly known as just jingle bells if you're uh, from uh, the United States, and uh, here they've just been made incredibly large and are kind of hovering in the landscape, but we've seen the addition, or the inclusion rather, of musical uh, elements in a lot of his uh, work. Uh, if we remember to his very, very first uh, surrealistic compositions, there was actually using uh, sheets of music, and here uh, with threatening weather we see uh, the, the, a, a, a horn as a part of the clouds uh, along with a female torso and also a chair. Um, I'm talking about imagining things in, in the clouds. There's your perfect example. Uh, and here we have one of his more famous images, uh, if not his most famous, and it's the Treachery of Images. Uh, and it is, of course, this painting of a pipe that says in French, uh, this is not a pipe. And this is uh, not only his most famous image, but I always feel that this is the image that really uh, uh, cements his ideas of, of what uh, he was trying to accomplish. Again, we have these kind of titles uh, around very, very simplistic objects, and this is really kind of the culmination uh, of, of those thoughts, I think, into one single thing. Uh, what we do notice, though, and we haven't seen this in a lot of his work so far, uh, is that he does have this direct inclusion of language onto the canvas, and uh, this is a very, very unusual thing, not only for the time period, but uh, it really kind of foreshadows a lot of the work uh, that will be seen later in the 1960s, uh, especially with pop art. Another interesting work we have from this period is On the Threshold of Liberty from 1930, uh, where this is almost him looking at uh, kind of the different ideas he has, and, and it really takes the place of almost different little windows or landscapes, and we can see a very large cannon kind of pointing off in the direction of that. So and it, it's almost like a breakthrough painting where uh, he's on the threshold again of this concept of liberty within his own work. Uh, that's at least my interpretation of the painting. He was not really achieving uh, financial success in Paris, so in 1930 he returns to Brussels uh, and he continues his advertising campaign. Uh, for a short while he will actually travel to London and live with Edward James. Uh, and he started to receive some notoriety and by 1936 he has his first exhibition in the United States uh, at the Ju Julian Levy Gallery. I see another evolution within his work when he does return to Brussels, uh, and we see kind of the object where before it was alone or or the the, the focus like the pipe. Uh, now it becomes a transformal part of the space uh, that it is now occupying, and I think a wonderful example of that uh, can be found in this painting, uh, the Human Condition from 1933, where we have a normal window. Uh, and somebody has painted just a landscape painting over uh, the space and has lined it up perfectly so it blends in and out. Uh, you could actually achieve this if you did the right angles uh, and you were able to make a masterful painting. And, and that's kind of my point, where before these objects were kind of isolated uh, and the title led us to the object, here the objects begin to transform. And as they transform, uh, that carries with it the surrealistic component uh, within the work itself. We see this concept again uh, when we look at one of his more famous paintings from this time period, the Red Model from 1934, where before he would have uh, a pair of boots maybe in this landscape uh, and maybe a surrealistic title, here the boots have actually been transformed into a pair of feet uh, and placed within a regular landscape. We see this again in Perpetual Motion uh, from 1935 where we have this idealistic strongman, uh, again from, from images of, of my past at least, holding up this cartoonish dumbbell, uh, but the ball has become his head. Uh, and there in the background we have a few other objects to kind of reference back to uh, the orb that is this person's head. I also feel we have a sense of playfulness 
uh, from the paintings in this time, like Portrait from 1935, where uh, we have what appears to be uh, perhaps a slice of ham evenly placed on a plate, but uh, there's this wonderful eye in the center of it looking back at us, uh, the viewer. We see a second version of the human condition painted kind of following the same traje trajectory as the, the previous one, uh, with now the landscape moves away uh, uh, from the space rather than just occupying the space that it's in. In 36, we have a series of self-portraits, uh, beginning with clairvoyance, where he's doing this wonderful painting of a bird uh, while looking at an egg, and this is uh, a perfect example, I think, of, of the type of mental activity that he tries to engage in uh, within his work. And I mentioned this before, that we kind of have this softness or this playfulness within his work, and Philosopher's Lamp, which I think is another self-portrait, uh, very much has that same kind of instinct where we see his nose kind of following following into uh, the famous pipe uh, that is, of course, his hallmark uh, from This Is Not a Pipe. We also have a portrait, again, of his wife, Georgette, uh, where, again, very, very simplistic, uh, realistic portrait, and, and that's something that we should always kind of go back to within uh, Magritte's work is that he paints in a very realistic fashion and very much following in the, 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 the same line as other surrealists like Dolly, uh, he uses that surrealism as his avenue uh, in order to make an access within the viewer. The Keys to the Field follows along the same kind of trajectory as his other window paintings, but now we have the broken window uh, and the pieces are a reflection of the landscape outside. We also have one of his more famous images uh, produced at this time uh, with not to be reproduced from 1937 where uh, we have a figure looking into a mirror and we see uh, the back of the figure in both, uh, again with the mirror being a very playful part uh, of the surrealistic vocabulary. On occasion, Magritte would make sculpture. Uh, the Future of Statues from 1937 is a good example of his sculptural work. Uh, it follows the same ideas that we will see uh, within his paintings, that of very recognizable images with a simple surrealistic turn or twist within them. Uh, much later in his life, he'll do a lot of sculptural work uh, that's actually just reproductions of a lot of his two-dimensional paintings. In 1937, we see René Magritte traveling to England and staying uh, with Edward James. Uh, and some of the work that we have from this period sees, again, this kind of transformation where, uh, again, it becomes a little bit more complex than the simplicity of images that we recently saw through 1936. Uh, one of his more famous paintings from this time period is Time Transfixed from 1938 uh, that has uh, essentially a locomotive coming out of a, a, a fireplace uh, with the connection of the steam and this very odd mirror that's not quite reflecting everything within the room. Uh, again, from this period, we also have another very famous image in the glass house from 1939, where we have the figure looking off, uh, but we have a crack, and we have this kind of Janus effect of him looking forward and backwards at the same time. Uh, as we move on to the second half of his career, what we'll notice uh, beyond the war is a change in style, uh, which, which kind of leads to a different uh, feeling within his work.